Back in May of 2017, NVIDIA released their GT 1030 GDDR5 memory to a decent amount of fanfare from the budget PC community. And a year later, they decided to confuse everyone by releasing the same exact card, now with DDR4 memory. It was panned by reviewers at release, but was it really that bad? At launch, the DDR4 model cost around £70, a steep ask back in 2018 for what was a worse card, when used GPUs were regularly available for much less. But its main selling point was the ultra low power draw and low profile. Now, they sell for anywhere in between £50 and £90 on eBay, and usually around £50ish on sites like Facebook and Gumtree. I found a decent deal on a PAL variant one of the card for just £25 off Gumtree. It has a small fan, which is surprisingly quiet, along with a silver heat sink which fans to keep the card nice and cool. The DVI and HDMI 3.0 are its only outputs, and it has a, a PCI Express 3.0 8x slot that handle all power delivery and connect connectivity for the card. The specs of the GPU are actually the same as the GT1030, only with slightly lower clocks, but these can be fixed with an overclock. It has 384 CUDA cores, with a base clock of 1152MHz, and a boost clock of 1379MHz, so just slightly lower than the original 1030. But when it comes to RAM, this is rather problem. As a cost saving measure at the time, they decided to switch from the more expensive GDDR5 memory to DDR4, like regular slotted memory. But it wasn't, it was like solid. And it is just a th two thirds of the original speed. So it's a real problem for streaming and textures and everything, and just holds the card back in many ways. Because it is just a lower clock 1030 with really bad RAM. But how will these downgrades affect it in the benchmark? First up is Doom Eternal, and at 720p on the lowest settings, it achieved an average of 38 FPS, with 1% lows of 23 FPS, and 0.1% lows of 4 FPS. A decent showing, and around that performance of the Athlon 3000G that we checked out in the last video, which you can check out in the corner if you want. So, not that bad a start for what was meant to be an awful GPU. Control was robbed next, at 540p on the lowest settings, and it achieved an average of 28 FPS, with 1% lows of 21 FPS, and 0.1% lows of 11 FPS. As I've said many times in the past, I've always found around 28 FPS to be perfectly playable for more third person games, and especially since this is more of a slow game, I would say this game could be playable if you really need it. Our benchmark run on the Miami map in Hitman 2 with 720p on the low settings, it achieved an average of 37 FPS, with 1% lows of 17 FPS and 0.1% lows of 5 FPS. This game, like Control, can be played with around that 25 FPS mark, so 36 actually feels pretty nice to me, playing on a lot of online cards recently. CSGO on the Community Benchmark map at 1080p on the low settings achieved an average of 67 FPS. Again, this is a lot more intensive than regular gameplay, so expect from around 80 to 100 FPS in regular gameplay. Beaming D-Drive at 900p on the low settings achieved an average of 45 FPS with 1% lows of 38 FPS and 0.1% lows of 37 FPS. So there was really not that many drops, and from my time with the Steam Deck I've found 45 frames per second to be just as smooth as 60 FPS. So this is a pretty good Beam and G card. Fortnite again, still getting weirder and weirder. 1080p, so 75% resolution score, lower settings, and it achieved an average of 51 FPS, with 1% lows of 23 FPS and 0.1% lows of 9 FPS. This is a decent experience again for the GT1030. Minecraft with shaders at 720p, the red resistance of 6 chunks, achieved an average of 29 FPS, with 1% lows of 22 FPS and 0.1% lows of 7 FPS. I write around that playable mark, but there are some dips, but I feel like that's more of a CPU bound thing because it's more of a CPU heavy game when loading in the world, not a GPU one. This is the first time this has happened actually, but I was trying to run Halo Infinite and when I opened it, this error popped up. I didn't think much of it, I opened the game 
But whenever queuing into the game, it loaded about half to 50% of the map, or half of it, or that's what the bar said, and I could never get in. Not to bots, not to real players. It was quite unfortunate, because I wanted to see what this would do. But I guess that's one of the problems with older low-end cards, is they just don't get insane driver support. I'll have to see if more things like this keep on happening in the future. Teardown at 768p with a render resolution of 75% and the low settings achieved an average of 25 FPS with one percent lows of 21 FPS and 0.1% lows of 12 FPS on my Chase benchmark. Last for the game benchmarks, we have the Unigen Heaven Extreme benchmark. And for this it achieved an average of 6.4 FPS with a score of 161. And then on the normal benchmark test, it achieved an average of 12 FPS with a score of 297. This is actually worse than the Athlon 3000G, so I feel like that's because I overclocked that and not this. Well, did I? Well, now for something this definitely was not designed for. VR. Being HDMI 2.0 compliant, there is nothing stopping us from using it to play some Beat Saber, except my own ability to withstand version sickness. Well, actually that's kind of harsh to be honest. I managed to get Beat Saber running at basically locked 90fps by setting the resolution of my Oculus Rift to 20% of the normal one and dropping the settings as far as I could. But with that, I was actually able to play and have a decent amount of fun. Then I tried Half-Life Alex and I even tried to overclock it, and only managed to get 14 FPS, which is nowhere near to be playable. But the overclock was not stable I found, so I didn't use it for any of the other gaming tests, just the VR tests. If you can deal with this eye squinting resolution, as it is not very crisp, then you can easily play simple games like Beat Saber or Gorn just for fun, and I was amazed by this, like, it's not as bad as I thought. A big problem with the GPU market is that companies like to screw over the low end by releasing uninteresting, or not even uninteresting, just bad graphics cards. Take the 6500 XT. That is an awful card because it only has two outputs, no encoder, and doesn't perform very well. It's got a 4 XPCI Express bus, and it costs £250 or £200, however much it costs. You need a decent balance. This card is an example of companies enjoying screwing over the lot and they're like, oh, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. It makes a big difference, because this is where everyone gets in. I remember, I used to look at this GT 1030 and just think, I wish I could have one. Back in like 2018, when I was watching Low Spec Gamer, and I was just, this is insane, this is so cool that it's performing so well for so little. But cutting this market for what is usually often entry-level people is just not fair. Because if you know your stuff, you know how to buy old graphics cards. Companies should just stop doing this. You should release products that are either what they say on the tin or just don't be deceitful. It makes me mad sometimes. So with that rant over, that's the GT 1030. Basically, from my understanding, you're basically just paying to put Athlon 3000G level performance of graphics in any old computer you want. That can be quite useful actually if you have like an older second or third gen computer and you just want a low power thing for like a small ITX build, it would be quite useful to just have that power of video encoding and better outputs and just to play some games. Is it worth 50 quid? No. Not at all. It's not worth that for a display adapter. 25 quid? Again, not really, because I paid 20 quid for that Athlon 3000G. And AM4 is really cheap right now, you can find boards for way less. But is it cool? Yes. I, I, I think I'll keep this card for the rest of my life, or as long as I don't need it, it's just a cool card to have, because it's small, useful, and relatively performant for the size and power draw. So thank you guys very much for watching, hope you enjoyed this video, please comment, like, and subscribe, and ciao!